Hey, what's up? It's Rich Wynn from Breaking in a Sequence, and you're listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Anyway, well, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, I guess the, uh, the first question, we could just jump right into it. Now that Defy the Algorithm is out and available, how do you feel about it, and what has been the response to it so far? Um, I am ecstatic that it's finally out, because we've been waiting. We've been sitting on this record for quite some time now. Um, and I'm, I'm just glad that it's out, because now that that's out, we can get out even more music. Right? <laughs> Right. Um, we packed everything uh, for this shortly before the pandemic hit and mixed it. And then, uh, oh, so, so we've been sat on, on it the it. whole time. Yeah, we've sat on it. We were advised not to release it yet. And then, uh, you know, everything started opening back up so we can finally release it. But in that time, we've, we've written more music, you know, and we've right. evolved beyond that. Um, but so far, um, from what I've been told, uh, people are liking it. You know, it's a, it's just the extension of the sound that, uh, that we had on acronym, just, right. uh, just a little bit harder, really. Right. Right. Do you feel that, so, uh, that downtime helped you guys? And I think it probably helped a lot of the bands and people to really hone in on their craft and to really focus on what matters and define themselves a little bit more. Um, well, first of all, I'm just going to say that that downtime really screwed us, right? Yes. It screwed up all momentum that we had, right. um, especially for us being a starting band, you know, like being, being a, a small band, uh, you need to use, you know, you need to strike when the iron's hot, so right. to say, right? And the iron completely cooled for us. <laughs> right. But um, we did use that time to, to continue to write. You know, and of course, in the very beginning of it, no one got together. We didn't get together to to play because we simply didn't know, right? There were right. too many unknowns about about what was happening for real in the pandemic. So we didn't get together for a few months, and when we did, we just started writing. So it's kind of a double edged sword. The pandemic slowed us down, but if we didn't have that time, we wouldn't have written the new material that we have currently. That is still to be released. Right. So are you guys planning on, and I'm sure you are, but I don't, I haven't seen a routing schedule. Are you guys planning on taking this out on the road? Um, yes and no. Um, right now, honestly, we're, you know, being a, a, a small band that we are, you know, we're, we're putting all this out without a label or anything. And that's, there's a lot behind putting out a release. Sure. that you know most people don't even think about so we're trying to line up everything yes we'll, we'll play shows here and there but i'm not sure we're going to you know go full-fledged tour on it um actually shortly before we released this record um we jumped in the studio to start tracking drums on our next effort so um oh, okay wow. i think in, be in between shows and tracking um we're, we're going to try to do that route, right? Shows and tracks. Sure. So to your point, though, to be fair, I think the, and maybe you've got a different take on this, I think the music business has changed quite a bit, right? And I think, you know, social media and maybe this pandemic with all these live streams and Zooms has sort of le normalized or leveled the playing field a little bit because at, while labels are important, I think the tools are there to be able to do it yourself successfully. Yeah, if you're good at social media. Yeah, that's the, right? no, like, that's the problem, right? I don't know if you go on social media and you look at you look at my page. I, I'm almost non-existent there. I, I don't right. go on it's it. It's a struggle, that for sure. Yeah, you know, I feel like it sucks time away from your day. Yeah. You know, and away from life and away from from built like skill building for right. your real life. Right. You know, and um, that's kind of what Defy the Algorithm is about. You know, like that title is basically about technology taking over your life, you know, including social media and all that. Uh, becoming a necessary evil, right? Because to my yes. point, then I guess, you know, you have to be out there promoting yourself. You have to be doing these 7 a.m. Zoom meetings and, and stuff like that to keep yourself out there. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise I don't know what to post about myself. I'm not that cool. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Here, here's what I'm having for dinner. Stuff. Right. I uh, know. Oh, I'm going to go to the mall or, you know, like uh, people don't care about my thoughts. Uh, I don't, I barely care about my thoughts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, I'm sure there is then a message. So if this, is there something or a takeaway you want your fans to walk away from after listening to a, after listening to a breaking in a sequence record? And I'm, I think you alluded to it a little bit, especially this record, but what's the big takeaway? Um, for me, the big takeaway is um, is basically defy the algorithm and even acronym is is all about um, hearing what our passion is, right? Our passion is music. Right. As a band, you know, we love playing music. It's not like we're we're going out there to become these this huge band because that does, just doesn't happen anymore, right? Right. And there, there's no label backing, so we're doing we're doing so much legwork outside of what anyone can see only other bands would know right, right. um it has to be a passion <laughs> at this point at the end of the day though don't you think that makes it feel or come across as more organic and more real because i mean you're not really in this to play it would be ideal to play madison square garden but that's not the you know the the goal the goal is just to get out there and play your music the way you you know you write it and to try and connect with fans which i think makes it super organic right Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's it's to be heard, right? I don't know if you're a musician or not, but every musician, I don't care what you say, every musician out there that's a true musician just wants to be heard, right? Right. I think I think that should be the core um, motivation behind playing, not to become rich and famous and right. you know hookers and blow and all that crap. Uh, I'm talking like you just want to be heard, and true musicians, once a musician, always a musician. Yes. Right? So you're always going to love music. Yeah. And I think even beyond musicians, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a hack. I played when I was in high school or whatever. But I think once music gets you, especially the harder, heavier stuff, once it, like, just bites you somewhere along the way, it's something that stays with you, like, forever. Because for me, like, I can remember the day I walked into a record store in high school, across the street from the high school, and there was this... Diary of a Madman record on the wall, and I had never seen or heard of Ozzy before, and I was like, fuck, what's this? And I bought it home in the first three seconds of the, you know, Over the Mountain set me off on a course that has never changed since. You know, I'm in a quest for all this heavy stuff, and it gets in your blood, right? Right. I think it's different now for kids, but yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean, because in those days, you would go home, and you would listen to that album front to back. You listen mm -hmm. to that record front to back, and you would just keep playing it and playing and playing until you remember until you got the track listing down and everything like that right so in your head you knew what song was coming next but that's not how that's not how music's digested anymore it's digested oh. by singles it's digested by um by playlists which uh which is basically a shuffle of, of different artists so you're not getting the full take on the artists anymore and i think like a lot of bands uh, their fans don't even get their deep cuts anymore because they're not listening to their album all the way. Yeah, through. I don't think there is such a thing as deep cuts anymore, right? Because everybody's doing the... I do a lot of these podcasts and most, probably 80% of the people we talk to or more are doing just the new single model. You know, like every six weeks we've got a new single and the whole long form vinyl like you just talked about is almost non-existent, which I think is a shame. Maybe I'm old school, but... I think it's a shame because it was a whole process of going to the record store on a Tuesday with your paper route money and, you know, buying that record that you read about and then sitting, like you said, for days on end on the floor, like in front of your stereo, just digesting every bit of that. Yep. With the booklet and everything, yeah. just reading everything that they have to say, trying to get into their mind. I mean, uh, I wish it was still like that, you know, because that's to me, yeah, I'm old school like that. I, I like that kind of stuff. And I, I, I feel like that builds a better connection with, with um, the listeners than, it, than social media does, in my yeah. opinion. And, you know, downloading once, like my son, they download one song and then it's on his playlist, like you said, and it's just, it is what it is. But there's no full length kind of thing, or you're not getting into the, the story or the way the record was sequenced. That was a whole art form as yeah. well right you know the ebbs and flows the way the, the music flew flew the yeah music, uh, flow the sorry flow, yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely i i 100 agree with that 
Um, and, you know, some of our fans, I mean, David's fans would like us to put out a full LP, mm-hmm. right? But us being so small, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's a so shame. That's sort of caught in the middle. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it is what it is. Um, but I think that if you combine the, the two EPs that we've released so far, you get a good sense of, of where we're growing, right. you know, because we have grown a lot since acronym and uh, we'll grow again once we release the next one. Right. When you guys you are know, writing, are you writing like with the live stage, the live setting in mind, like how it's going to come across on stage? Or are you writing the song just for a song's sake? Um, well, David likes to write it on how it would feel live. Mm-hmm. Right. So David will always say, oh, this tempo's wrong. We need to make it more bouncy. We need to make it like this. And then he lets uh, he lets me basically control the, the structuring of the song around my vocals. Right. And the, the guys just they play to the energy of the track. Okay. So it's kind of like a, a whole melding process of, of different things <laughs> is the writing process very collaborative or is it more the efforts of one person very collaborative so how how uh, we write is the guys will get into a room without me because i live uh, about 80 miles north of them mm-hmm. um, they'll get into a room and they'll jam out so either someone will bring in a riff or or there'll be a beat that's that david's playing and the guys just start jamming on it and what they'll do is they'll jam out about 20 minutes on like different riffs and record it they, they'll record multi-track stems for me and then they'll send it to me via like google drive or dropbox right. or something and so they've worked on the song for like hours and hours already so their ears are dead to it when i hear the multi-tracks that they send um it's i i have fresh ears right so i'll hear i'll hear oh, okay this is great so i'll cut the song the, the track in the session or sections and then i'll re-piece it together to how i hear certain parts so parts that they hear as choruses i might hear as a verse or a right. bridge or something like that so i'll re-piece together the song and then send it back to them and then they'll listen to it and learn it and then while they're learning it i will write my vocals over it and then once i have my vocals over it, i send it back to them and they'll rewrite their parts around my vocals so that everything flows properly. Gotcha. So it goes back so, to for a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's like a multi-stage process. And then we'll go down there after the song's done and we'll actually play it live. And then whatever doesn't work, we'll adjust there too. And that's an interesting thing. I know we're being very nostalgic on here and that wasn't the, uh, the intent of the whole podcast. But that's another thing that I think is very different than a lot of other bands because now with the technology and with the coming out of the pandemic and all this other stuff most of it or a lot of the people i talked to are doing it all electronic and like meeting up when it's time to you know prep for the show there's none of that yes. old school like you just said bouncing things off each other in a room and realizing how hey, you know this doesn't work or maybe the tempo is off or something that i think makes it also sound very more organic as well absolutely and you know you just hit on a point um, that I like to talk about in interviews and with my friends. Technology has gotten to the point where, um, where it's it's almost kind of killed rock music, right? Because, uh, I, and I understand this, you know, but rock bands will go in or metal bands will go in and record, and it's cheaper to program your drums than it is to go into a studio with all your drums, mic them up, and spend the time to get your drum tracks right the way that you want them to feel. Right. Right. So all the drums are gridded to hell, right? On a grid. They're quantized. Yep. Um, the whole song is just the same tempo. There's no there's no swing anymore. You know, um, the vocals are all processed to be perfect. Guitar yes. lines are perfect. So what that has done is it's taken out all stylistic attributes from Yeah, from it's like surgically preci- precise and it doesn't yeah. I don't think it works. I understand for sure. Yeah. So uh, I think that that has killed rock music because you don't have, you don't have those singers that do their, their certain little things. You don't have those players like John Bonham, you know, with their, with their swing feel, you don't have that feel anymore. Everything is a ro- robotic sounding to me. Mm-hmm. So I'm fully against that. And now with technology getting so good, there's bands using auto tune live, 
you know, there's all these backing tracks that everyone's using, you know, and I, I don't mind backing tracks, but um, I feel like I'm used to seeing a band without it. Yes. You know, and, and it's cool to hear the difference of the song live than on the record, right? You don't want to play it exactly to the record because what's the point? Might as well just play the record right. and, and lip sync along. And, and, and save the 65, 70 bucks of ticket or whatever it is. Right. I 100% agree. Yeah. So that's, that's my thing. I mean, I, you know, and during the pandemic, a lot of bands live streamed and all that, but, you know, they went in and they corrected and auto tuned themselves before they released that stuff. And if you, if you listen to our live stuff, yeah, I'm pitchy, but Hey, guess what? I'm human. I think it's real. It's meant to be human. Yeah. Right. No, that makes sense. And I know some of the live streams I saw were, like you said, like, um, you know, corrected or whatever, but there was some that would just blew my mind. I think, I don't know if you're a Catatonia fan, but Catatonia did one right at the beginning. They were one of the first ones to do like a really big scale and it was so freaking good. They were on it. Really? I gotta go check that out if, if it's out there. Yeah, hopefully it still is. It was like, I don't know, when it, right shortly after the pandemic started, when everything started in lockdown, they did this from, a, you know, one of their studios over in Sweden and it was just mind blowing how great it was. But then I've seen oh, others you know that were not. I think I saw that. I think I actually saw that. And I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and see, so that, that's the, that's the uh, positive note here. Since everything is gridded and everything is robotic on the recording and bands are trying to sound like the recording, um, musicians have gotten so much better. <laughs> right? They, they've gotten so much better on one hand but they lost their stylistic traits on yes. the other hand. So, so here's another, gotta be a balance. Yeah. But here's another thing I'll just throw out there. And I know we're way off the topic of breaking in the sequence. I'm sorry. We just kind of rambled, but no, we're talking I music. Think, I think there's breaking going in to, sequence right there. <laughs> I think there's going to be, and maybe it's already started a sort of artistic Renaissance because everyone's been in their basement or their studio or their garage or whatever for the last two years honing their craft and practicing and maybe not just in music maybe in the painting and photography or whatever but i think we're gonna we're on like the cusp of this crazy artistic renaissance because everybody's now the gates have opened and it's like hey let's go i hope so i mean i i, I can honestly say i hope so um i just i just feel like um like maybe the new musicians or the musicians that have picked, you know, re-picked up their instruments during this time. I just hope that they go out and, and form bands, right? You're not seeing bands being formed anymore like you used to at yep. the rate that you used to. You're seeing Guitar Center and, and even, what, Gibson? They, didn't they file for bankruptcy? Yeah. Gibson Guitars? I mean, that tells you something right there. Oh, yeah. So, so basically what happens is once all these bands are done or you know people lose the passion for it um the world's going to be ruled by electronic music and pop music and it's <laughs> you know, funny and you said that too completely I gridded i feel sometimes worried because some of our idols like i mentioned ozzy and you know some of our idols are way up there in age and they're not going to be long here and i think that's going to die with them is all this tradition of playing live music and really bouncing it stuff off each other in the studios and and doing all that stuff that we're talking about here. You're right. It's going to be all electronic. That's all people are going to know. I know. And it's really sad. I mean, this year, what? Dream Theater won, won a Grammy finally, right? After, right? Yeah. After so long. But it was, wasn't even televised because rock music is being shielded, you know, to, the, to everyone, to the majority right. of people. And if you watch television, um, it's like it's looked down upon to even be in a band these days, right? Oh, he's in a band. Right. <laughs> you know, like it, there's so much, there's so many things wrong, you know, and then you, you don't see these new bands. You don't see new super groups forming, right? I think the last group of super groups was from the two thousands. And the reason why you don't see that is because, um, well, people digest music differently. Very right. Uh, you know, people aren't, uh, you're not going to make as much money off of it. So you're not going to dedicate your life and time to playing music anymore. People just want to be famous these days. Yeah. You know, like quick fix 15 minutes of fame or whatever. And, um, I just feel like, like, 
uh, the fan base and, and listeners aren't letting bands get to their build to their final form to their full potential. Mm-hmm. Right. You don't see that evolution of bands anywhere because they kind of die on the vine. Yeah, I think you're right. That's crazy. So, anyway, so we're coming to the end here. What, um, what's next for breaking in a sequence? What can we look forward to? Um, shows and more music. I mean, we've spent the last what two years not releasing music, not playing shows. So we just want to get out there and play shows and release music and do what we can before we die on the vine, so to speak, right. or whatever. You know, I mean, again, this is a passion. We don't have a, a label behind us or anything. So we're doing it all ourselves. Right. And if you're not in a band out there and you're wondering, oh, how come you don't release music more frequently? Go look at what it takes to release music from studio to PR to artwork, album, everything like that. There's a lot going on behind the scenes that, that you're just not aware of. Yep. Thank you, my friend. Hope that wasn't too bad. No, it was great. I, I, like I love just having an organic conversation. Yeah, I like to just chat. I have a list of uh, questions I had here or topics, but we kind of usually end up just wandering, and I think that makes for a better show. So, Absolutely, yeah. Awesome. Thank and you for I taking the, the time. Conversation. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Be well, my friend. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Have I'll a good talk one. talk to you soon. Right now. Bye.